Welcome again. If you are a guest this morning, we uh, take Easter seriously here at Highland Oaks. There are several opportunities for us to not just get in the spirit of the season, but rather help us to focus our hearts and our minds uh, towards a place that we think matters. Today is Palm Sunday, Sunday before Easter, and I just want to begin not by reading the text, but allowing you to see the text. And so I'm going to give you just a few moments to ponder what's on the screen before you, and then I would like to pray and then join you as we see what God has to say. God, may these ancient words continue to change and to shape us into being more like who you desire us to become, a people who have been shaped by the cross, who follow a Savior, a Savior who willingly chose to die on our behalf and to show us a way to live. Pour through me now the gift of preaching, of story, and of imagination. For it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank God Easter is almost here. But not yet. Have you seen the images of these poor people on the Northeast? They're experiencing their fourth Nor'easter. Which I have no idea what a Nor'easter is other than it looks miserable. Buckets of snow, ice, wind coming off the ocean. I bet they're ready for a change, something different for spring. But winter doesn't always come with the reality of snow. It often comes in the bitter reality of life. And some of you are experiencing winter even now. The winter of opportunity, the winter of unemployment, the winter of divorce, the winter of depression, the winter of life. And thank God Easter is almost here, but not yet. My friend Michael lives in Kentucky, and he lives in Lexington, which is close to Cincinnati. And I recall a few years ago when Michael would tell me, Pat, around March and April, all we want to see is the sun. And I think this morning there's a bit of that in me. I just want to see the sun. But I hear John in this text, this cross, inviting us to a place and saying, Not yet. And maybe that's the frustration with Palm Sunday in that we teach our our children about branches and waving them in the air and welcoming Jesus into town. And we say we need to celebrate the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem. But don't you find it a bit ironic that we're celebrating the march of death? You see, Easter is a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. But there's a not yet that we ought to pay attention to. I heard a painful not yet story this week from my friend Emma Banks back here, whose daddy went overseas last year and won't be home until July. And every night, Emma has a bowl of Hershey Kisses that represent a day until her dad comes home. So every night, I imagine Emma looks in this bowl of Hershey Kisses and she takes one out, not two, but one out, and that one Hershey Kiss represents one more day until her dad can scoop her up into his arms and hold her once again. But not yet. 
This is where we have to find ourselves today. This tension of knowing that there's something that's coming that will be an enormous release, but not yet. John has us facing the reality of the cross, and he's had us here for several weeks. Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. This was not a metaphor. This was not some parable. Jesus was actually laying down his life. The lamb was to be slaughtered. One scholar points out that the place of the cross was not the only place where blood was shed because they were shedding blood at the temple as well. It was Passover time. Death is all around. There was, for a few moments, a few days, no hope of Easter. You see, you don't know it's going to be the third day until you actually get to the third day. John Ortberg, in his book, Who is This Man?, devotes an entire chapter to what Saturday must have been like for the disciples. Where they woke up after the events of Friday, after the crucifixion. And there was an entire day where they had no idea Sunday was coming. They may have been told, but the reality of doubt and despair creeps in. And there's a not yet of the cross that we must wrestle with. There's a sign above the head of Jesus King of the Jews. I think if John were writing this in our language today, John would use air quotes. King of the Jews. Do you ever use air quotes? We use air quotes a lot at our house. Our youngest, Andrew, came up to us uh, last year and said, Hey, Mom, Dad, are we going to Nana and Papa's house so we can go on vacation? Obviously not understanding what air quotes mean. Because air quotes are the things that you put in quotes that don't really mean what you think it means, right? Like if you have a cheese stick and you call that lunch. Or if you go on vacation to a place that you really don't enjoy and you call that getting away. You see, John is saying, here is Jesus, King of the Jews. Because this is not the King that you'd expect. Which is why Palm Sunday ought to matter to us. And people throughout the centuries have depicted today, and they're celebrating today, this triumphal entry, this parade, this celebration. And I want to remind us that for John, as we discussed last week, everything is not as it seems. This is the king comes to triumph through dying. This is the one who gains victory By getting himself killed. Death is all around. So the last words recorded by John. Of Jesus. In no other gospel. Except this one. Jesus simply says. It is finished. I don't know about you. But I don't know what to do with that. I don't particularly like death. Had a preacher one time tell me, Pat, there's nothing like a good funeral. To which I would say, you are sick and twisted, man. I'd rather do a wedding any day than a funeral. Because there's part of us that wants to ignore death. Do you remember the first time you went to see the Passion of the Christ, if you've seen it? And you sit there for like two hours of this terrible drama where they do all of these terrible things to Jesus and then right at the end there's this one moment where you see this and that's it. That's the resurrection. And I remember sitting there watching this movie going, wait a second, there's more to this story. Why are you ending it there? I don't like this. Well, guess what? I still don't like it. And maybe that has more to do with me than it does about the story of Jesus because we like to ignore death. In fact, many of us try to cheat death. We take medications to get out of dying. And I'm not ignoring the reality of death. No, I want us to head straight into it. 
Because this is what the cross invites us to learn, is that death comes before resurrection. You cannot have life without death. And even when we sing about this moment of the cross, we try to color it in a way that's often not helpful. I grew up at a wonderful church called the Bel Air Church of Christ. Don't let the words Bel Air hang you up because it was anything but Bel Air Country Club. Trust me. It was a wonderful, loving place. And we had this song leader named Don. And the beautiful thing about Don is he would sing every part for everybody. And one of my favorite ones that he did was heaven came down and glory filled my soul. And then Don would go, filled my soul, that desk can't part. But listen to these words. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Filled my soul. When at the cross, the Savior made me whole. Made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Isn't it fascinating that we sing about glory being a good thing, and yet John paints exactly the opposite picture. Glory for Jesus is the journey to the cross. Glory for Jesus is you dying to yourself. Glory is all about darkness. What do we do with this story? Are we willing to linger here long enough and ask what death will teach us? These last words, it is finished from John 19. Kind of drives me nuts that there's an indefinite pronoun here, doesn't it, you? It is finished. What's the it? John doesn't tell us what the it is. He simply says, it is finished. How would you feel if somebody walked into your house and says, it's done? What are you talking about? Well, perhaps we need to understand the word finished, and I'm so grateful for our young ladies that talk during communion about this word finished, because finish can mean a lot of things, right? Finish the yard work, finish your homework, finish that Netflix show, finish that project at work. At our house, it's finish your dinner. And then this wonderful thing that happens, can I be done? In other words, the word finish, the way we often use it, focuses on the product rather than the process. And I want to think, boys, your mother has spent a lot of time. Trust me, if I'd have done it, I'd have ordered pizza. Sure, you can be done, whatever. But you need to be grateful for the process because finish is not just about moving on to what's next. It's about being deeply appreciative and satisfied of all that's been in the process. So when Jesus says it is finished, he's acknowledging this process that didn't start with his birth, that started with the story of creation. It's the whole of the story of Scripture, which is why John points out over and over again, this happened so that Scripture could be fulfilled. In verse 24, they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who gets it. This was to fulfill what the Scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for clothing they cast lots. And then what we discovered last week, when Jesus knew all that was now finished, He said, in order to fulfill Scripture, I am thirsty. In verse 36, these things occurred so that the Scripture might be fulfilled. None of His bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of Scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. It's like these signs and flashing lights Jesus is finishing, accomplishing the work that God started long before Jesus ever walked on the earth. Which was why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, this is the gospel where according to the scriptures, Jesus died. You see, death is a part of the story and as much as you would like to ignore it, you can't. Because it's here. Inviting us in, 
daring us to look at its truth. And the truth is that the work of God was complete at the cross. The work of God was complete at the cross. Which is why it's a little odd that John says, after Jesus says, it is finished, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. That's troubling as well. He bowed his head and he gave up. Do any of you like to picture Jesus as giving up? I don't. Kind of look like the Kansas State coach last night getting fired up at his team. Anybody watch that game? Don't quit. Don't give up. You can't give up. Giving up is the sign of defeat. It's throwing in the towel. It's saying, you know what, I'm done. But the word here for give up is misunderstood if we think it's about Jesus quitting or throwing in the towel. This phrase, give up, is the same phrase Jesus uses when he says, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head or give up. It's a term of rest. It's a term of everything is now whole. And so I'm wondering if part of the truth of death that we fail to embrace is this invitation for us to join Jesus in His humanity and recognize that we can be at rest in death. Where death embraces death. And there's this divine moment where the death that we experience makes sense in light of the death of Jesus. It's this holy moment where we, we travel towards Resurrection Sunday, but we don't travel there yet. And we join Jesus, and our death meets His death, and we hold on, and we wait. It's the missing puzzle piece of God's story. It's the puzzle piece underneath the couch that you find that completes the picture. It is finished. It's complete. So what's the dare? I, I, I think the dare is to come to grips with the reality of death and allow the death of Jesus to hold on to us in our moments of death. I can't shake this image that I saw a few weeks ago from the Florida shootings. A, a tragic event. But it happened on Ash Wednesday, if you recall. And the news captured this image of what I assume to be a mother holding her child. But the mother had just come from an Ash Wednesday service and she has the sign of the cross on her forehead. It is death embracing death. And for me, this is the image that we ought to hold as we get to Easter, but not yet. And some of you, even me, have experienced the death of loved ones and today is an invitation for Flint and Joanna, for Floyd, for Kathy, for Neil, and all of us who have lost someone so death can hold on to death. It's an invitation for those of you that have lost opportunities, maybe the death of a dream. It's for Kaylee and Mark. And so many of these students, 
Because death isn't just the loss of a loved one. Sometimes it's the loss of what you thought ought to happen. Even the death of your idea of God. And at the risk of calling names. It's death that gives way to doubt. And death that gives way to despair. And death that convinces you that you are somehow less spiritual. Because you may not believe in God anymore. And yet death holds on. To death. I am so ready for Easter, but not yet. Let those who have ears to hear hear the word of God.